walking with God? Am I walking with God? See, that's important. We need to understand that and recognize that that is important. You heard read from the scriptures a few moments ago from Genesis chapter 5. Enoch lived 365 years, had a family, lived a life pretty much on earth from an earthly standpoint as everybody else does. But from a sin standpoint, he was different. He walked with God. And the record says as he walked with God, he was not. He ceased to exist. He stopped his earthly living because God took him. I think there's a lesson there I want us to consider this morning. And I want us to see if we can develop that. Walking with God was God's original intention for the man that he created and loved. God made a perfect world and placed two perfect people in it. But sin entered into the life of Eve. She shared it with Adam and they were separated from God by their sin. But in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, the record says that they were afraid, they hid themselves because after they'd eaten the forbidden fruit, they were naked. And then it says, but they heard the sound of God walking in the garden. They heard the sound of God walking in the garden. The implication and inference is that this was God's usual method of communication with them. That in the cool of the evening, he would come and he would walk with the creatures that he made because God created us to love us and to have someone who would love him back. And he created us to have a fellowship with him, a union with him, a, a, a situation where we could be at harmony and peace with him. But sin disrupted that. So when sin entered the world, man lost his physical reference to God, his physical position with God. But isn't it wonderful? And a wonderful blessing it is that God has made sure that today you and I can still walk with him. Not physically, not like Adam and Eve did, but we can walk with God because he sent his son from heaven to go to that cross to give his life to die for us as Jeff so ably pointed out. That he could take away our sin which separated us and give us a union and a fellowship with him once more. So that we have this wonderful wonderful privilege of being able to walk with God today and my hope and my prayer is that you choose to do that today if you've not chosen that before and that if you have chosen that you'll try today to walk closer to him to be more commendable to his word and to live as he wants you to live see he longs for us God wants to have a relationship with us he longs for us to seek and to obtain and to maintain fellowship with him he wants you to be close to him when Paul was preaching on Mars Hill to those Athenian philosophers, in Acts chapter 17, verse 27, he was explaining God to them. One of the things he said, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. He is not far from each of us. God wants us to seek him out to try to maintain and build a relationship with him according to the way he's told us to do it. Now, when you think about Enoch, he's remarkable for several reasons. Several reasons. He walked with God at a time when men were progressively becoming more sinful. As you think about uh, Enoch's life, he was living in a sinful world with sinful people all around him. But in all of that, he was still walking with God. His contemporaries and his friends and maybe some of his family we're not walking with God, but he was. And so he was walking with God in a time when the world was getting worse and worse. There are three basic things I want us to notice about him this morning. First, he walked with God by faith. Enoch walked with God by faith. If you and I are going to walk with God, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we're going to walk with God by faith. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith. Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Notice then verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them 
who diligently seek Him. Faith is required. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Enoch walked with God by faith, and that was the only way he could walk with God. Because without faith, one cannot walk with God. He pleased God. That's the second thing we notice. How did he please God? This has to do with his conduct in life. While all of his friends and contemporaries were engaging in sin, he was following God. He was doing what God told him to do. He was trying to live as best he could. All that he did or purposed was pleasing in the sight of him who judges the heart. Now please don't misunderstand. Enoch was not perfect. He sinned just like you and I do. But his heart was pointed and directed toward God. His desire, his aim, his goal in life was to do exactly what God wanted him to do and fall to the best of his ability. Though sometimes he stumbled and fall just like you and I do. But he pleased God. And the third thing then is, he was not for God took him. God took him from this world of sin and rebellion. Enoch never experienced the pangs of death. He never experienced the suffering that comes sometimes with death. Evidently, even in his prime, 365 years, was young in that day and age as far as the length of life went. But think about this with me. Enoch's great-grandson, Noah, was alive in the time when God said, I'm going to destroy the world by water because the hearts of men are seeking and thinking of evil only continually. And just three generations after Enoch was gone, this world became so corrupt that God said he was going to destroy it. Enoch was spared that. He did not have to go through that because of the fact that God took him because he pleased God and he tried to live as God wanted him to live. So God's grace and mercy spared him then. The onslaught of the evil intentions and the evil deeds of all of his contemporaries and the sinful world in which he would have lived had he lived a little longer. But when you think about it, how can we walk with God? I mean, we talked about Enoch. I mean, that's good and that's wonderful. But how does that apply to me? And how does that apply to you? How, how can we walk with God? Well, first, just like him, the first essential is faith. Do you remember Hebrews 11:6? without faith? It's impossible to please God. For everyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you think about that, there's something that says we cannot see God, you see. Physically, for the physical senses, we can't experience God. John 1, 18 tells us that no one can see God at any time. Jesus said in John 4, God's a spirit. In Luke 24, he said a spirit doesn't have flesh and blood, flesh and bones. So when you think about it, we can't see God. So we walk by faith. We walk with God by faith. What does that mean? It means that we believe in him. That we understand that he is the creator of the world through his son. That he gave his life to take us from sin to salvation. That he came to redeem us from our sins. And so in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians rather, chapter 5 verse 7, Paul wrote these words. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. But what is faith? Let's look at three questions. What is faith? What does faith do? And how do we obtain faith? Well, let's begin with the idea of what is faith. Just what is faith anyway? Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? It means my confidence in my God and in my Savior Jesus is so strong that I am persuaded, totally, completely persuaded that he is, number one, able to do everything that he promises and says, and that, number two, he's willing to do everything that he says and promises. And my conviction is, though I cannot see it with the naked senses, I know that God, what God says is true. I know what he's promised is going to come to pass. I know the warnings that he gives me I need to heed. I am convinced that God is God and that he means what he says and says what he means. And that he gives me the opportunity to walk with him, to live with him here, and to experience his presence forever in eternity in heaven. He's promised me that, he's given me that. So number one, that is faith. Faith is conviction. Faith is evidence. Faith is, is the thought that I know, I know it's going to happen just what God said. But then what does faith do? Faith motivates. Read the rest of Hebrews chapter 11. It begins in verse 3 by saying, By faith, 
We understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so what is seen is not made out of things which are visible. Think with me a moment now. What faith motivates? He goes on to say, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, by faith Sarah. What does that mean when it says by faith? It means whatever they did, they did according to what God said do. And when, God, when they understood what God said do, they wanted to do it in their lives. They wanted to make it a part of their life. They wanted to follow what God said. They wanted to live by God's rules. They wanted to do what God told them to do. Faith motivated them to do something. And if you and I ever give up the world of sin and turn away from it in repentance and come to the Lord and obey the gospel and become a Christian, it will be because of faith. Salvation is by faith. Faith does what God says do when God says do it in the way God said do it. So that's what, how faith works. But thirdly, where is the source of faith? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We aren't born with faith. We don't absorb it by osmosis. You can sit in sermons like this in classes and hear the word of God preached and that's a help. But we don't get faith completely like that. We get faith by a study, a seeking and learning and digging deeply into God's holy inspired word. And when we do that, we increase our faith, our faith grows, we become stronger in our faith, we're more able to overcome Satan, we have a better hope of our salvation, and we can live a better and more happy life. Faith then comes by the hearing of God's word. Many, many years ago, there was a famous tightrope walker named Zimbrotti. On one occasion, he has stretched a cable from one side of Niagara Falls to the other. And in a driving rainstorm and a heavy wind, he walked across that tightrope from one side of Niagara Falls to the other. As soon as he got to the other side, he was met by a super fan. And he begged Zimbrotti to go back across that cable again, but this time to push a wheelbarrow on the cable. And conveniently, he had to have the, happened to have the wheelbarrow with him. Zimbrotti didn't want to do it. He said it was dangerous and he, he really didn't want to do it. And the man kept on insisting, oh, oh, you can do it, you can do it. I know you can do it. And finally Zimbrotti said, well now, are you really, really and truly convinced that I can do it? And the fan said, oh, oh I know you can, I, I know you can. He says, okay, I'll do it, you get in the wheelbarrow. Now guess what happened? Guess what happened? The man in his wheelbarrow left and Zimbrotti was left standing there. See, that's the difference between supposed belief and faith. Belief says, I believe it. Faith says, I'll do it. Belief says, yes, it's possible. Faith says, I know it can be accomplished. When you think about the idea between faith and belief, we understand then that by faith, we walk with God. It is faith that brings justification. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, we are justified by Christ. Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the bond, the cement, if you will, that which binds us to God because we take hold of Him in His Word, through His Word, and we're not going to ever give up or let it go. But the second requirement to walk with God is agreement and harmony. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, God is pronouncing punishment upon the nation of Israel. He's doing it through the prophet Amos. And in verse 3 of chapter 3, God says through Amos, can two walk together except they be agreed, or unless they be agreed? Can two walk together unless they be agreed? That's true in a marriage, it's true in a church, it's true in a friendship, and it's true in our relationship with God. You see, we must harmonize our wills to God, not His will to ours. We must say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. We must say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm, I'm ready to do to the best of my ability. We must harmonize our wills with him. May your will be done. Now, it's easy to say this. I want to tell you from personal experience. It's easy to say, Lord, your will be done. But then to live by that concept, to live by that precept is a difficult thing. Lord, may your will be done. And when we have accomplished that, when we do that and say that and mean it, great things can be accomplished in our life. Submission, though, is the key to walking with God if we're going to walk in harmony. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your ways. We think from a human perspective. God thinks from a divine perspective. And if we're going to submit to him and walk in his way, we have to do it according to what he's told us to do. There must be unity with God first in our thoughts. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it can't, who is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then are those who are in the flesh cannot please God. My thoughts must be like his thoughts. Where do I get my thoughts? From his holy inspired word. Secondly, it must be harmony and agreement in our doctrine, in our teaching, what we accept, what we believe, what we follow. What governs my life spiritually? What governs my life physically? What governs my life mentally? How do I walk with God? By following the doctrine and the teaching. Listen to the early church. In Acts chapter 2, the record tells us that there were 3,000 who obeyed the gospel on that day and they added to them, added to the church. And then in verse 42, it says, they continued steadfastly. Notice that word. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What is the apostles' doctrine? It's the message that God sent from heaven through his son. It was the inspired message given to the apostles. It was the inspired message which they wrote down for all of us. It was the inspired message which you have in your hands today if you own a Bible, and I know you do. Well, one of many kinds probably. But the apostles' doctrine is, is what we must follow. If we're going to walk with God, it must be in accordance to his teaching and doctrine. And with the things that we follow. I can't make up my own plan of salvation. I can't devise my own plan of worship. I can't devise my own plan of living with God. God's told me what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And so that's what I do. But then Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him he called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we preach, let him be accursed. If anybody preaches anything else other than what you've heard from us, what came from God, what came from Christ, what was given through the Holy Spirit, let that person be accursed. There's one gospel. It's the one you hold in your hand. It's the one you read about in the inspired New Testament. And men may devise their own plans, but they won't work. There's only one plan, and that's God's plan. Not only must we believe that the scriptures teach, but we must be governed by them in our relationship with God. And John says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth not in him. Did you catch what he said? He said, if we, we know him if we keep his commandments. He who does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to stand this. There's a light. The sun is reflecting off a windshield out of, that car, out of the car in the parking lot. And I'm about half blind up here. <laughs> Jack, can you close that door? I can see you, but I can't really see who you are. Ah, that, thank you. Give me a minute to find out where you are. Are you all still in the same place? Okay, good. All right. We must be governed and live by what he's told us to do then. There must be also agreement and harmony in our way of life. My life must be governed not only in my thinking, not only in my worship, not only in my service, but my life must be governed by what God told me to do. He says, as Paul does in Ephesians 4.22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The old man grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off the old man. What old man? Old man of sin. Old man of selfishness. Old man of self-serving. And put on the new man. The man who walks by faith. The man who loves God. The man who wants to do what God says to do. And the man who's trying to do all that he can. And so he was one of the keys then to the success of Enoch in that he walked as God directed. There have been many de determinations to live, you know, we must determine to live faithfully according to what he told us to do. 
Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. If a man finds his life, he'll lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake, he will find it. Faithfulness is required. When you think about Enoch, yes, he walked with God. But it wasn't a sporadic part-time, off-time thing. It was the fact that he walked with God all the time. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So let's, let's make the application now. What are the benefits of walking with God? We looked at Enoch. We saw that he walked with God. He pleased God. He walked by faith. And God took him, which means he removed him from this life and take, took him to the place that God has prepared for us until the resurrection comes. So let's think about what's the first blessing? We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with God. Now don't, don't just skip over that lightly. I want to tell you this is a, a wonderful one. Adam and Eve had it and they lost it. Enoch regained it by walking according to what God told him to do. And he kept it. You and I have the opportunity to have fellowship with God. If you're here this morning and you've never obeyed the gospel, you're separated from God. You're outside of Christ. You're without God and without hope in this world. But you can have fellowship with God. You can find your way back. You can come to Him through our simple obedience to the gospel in faith, turning away from your sins, confessing His name, being immersed in the waters of baptism, and be raised to walk in newness of life. And you will have fellowship with God. Your old sins will be gone. He'll add you to His church. You'll be part of His family. And you have a, you'll have a special place near and close to His heart. And if you're here this morning and you've wandered away, and you've not lived as you ought to have lived as a Christian, You've gone back in the world or you've lost your first love. You can come back and have fellowship again. The kind of fellowship you once had. Do you remember how you felt when you came up out of the waters of baptism? Do you remember that good feeling that you felt, that, that joy and that peace and that happiness? You can have it again. You can have fellowship with God. See, we never face life on our own. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. God is our refuge and strength. And so when we think about it, then He will never leave us, no matter how difficult the problem is. When you walk with God, He walks with you. When you draw near to Him, He draws near to you. When you live like He wants you to live to the best of your ability, He forgives your sins, brings you close to Him, and has a place prepared for you. And then it's already been mentioned. The final thing I want us to notice this morning. God sent His Son from heaven to save us, and says, brought his son back to heaven to prepare a place for us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, many places. There's plenty of room. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that I may be with you and you may be with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, beginning. Paul talks about those that are dead in Christ. And he concludes the thoughts by saying that he will come back for us. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead of Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. I want to ask you this morning, where's your relationship to God? Are you walking with Him as Enoch did? Or are you walking with Satan? What's your status this morning in relationship to God and to Christ? Have you submitted your life to Christ? Are you obedient to His will? Are you doing to the best of your ability everything that He wants you to do? Are you trying to live faithfully in every, day that you've, in every moment of every day that you live? Reward is great for that. But this morning you have a unique opportunity. You have something this morning you've never had before and you may never have again. You have an opportunity. If you need to change your life, 
If you need to make your life right, if you need to become a Christian or to come back to the Lord, you have an opportunity to do that today. And I want to beg you, I want to plead with you. If you need to do that, would you please come and do it right now while we're standing and singing?